So the first speaker for this session, this is going to be a session on miscellaneous talks by PPL students. The first speaker is uh, Bilge Akun, who is a PhD candidate in PPL. She's going to talk about neural network based power optimizations in CHAM++. So I hand it over to Bilge. Thank you, Nitin. Yes, hi everyone. So my talk is going to be about power and energy efficiency. So over the years at PPL, we not only make Charm++ more performance efficient and reliable, we also worked on making Charm more power efficient as well. So recent work of ours, including me and many past PPL members, has been highlighted in IEEE computer. And in this work, we envision for future generation systems where the runtime system dynamically interacts with the data center's resource manager to do various power optimizations. For example, shrinking and expanding the number of processors the application is running on. And the runtime can also meet not only system level constraints, such as power caps, but also it can meet uh, the objectives of the users and system administrators as well. So to be able to achieve this, Charm++ first needs to, act, needs to interact with an external uh, resource manager and CCS client uh, connection interface provides that ability to Charm. And so also Charm has here, uh, has a local manager which not only tracks information such as objects loads, which are commonly used to do load balancing, it also tracks CPU information and power consumption, uh, similar information as well. Uh, the second component here you see is migration and load balancing module that many of you are familiar with. And the third one is the power resiliency uh, module, which can, for example, ensure that the CPU temperatures remain below a temperature threshold or under a po power cap in, an, in the most optimized way. So after giving some high-level um, design, now I'm going to move to more specific work that I've been doing in collaboration with IBM Research. And this work is support for proactive cooling decisions with neural network-based temperature prediction model. So the motivation of this work is power consumption of the supercomputers. So we talked about the whole day how supercomputers can be used to achieve lots of scientific uh, achievements and breakthroughs, but there's a cost for that. And the cost is megawatts of power consumption of these machines. And some other problems include larger process variations, temperature radiations, more and more heat dissipation, and denser nodes in future generations. So as an, uh, to give an example of that, so the top plot here shows the temperature variation of the cores within a single node. And at first, when the cores are idle, there's a 7 degrees Celsius temperature radiation. And as the time goes on, when the, some of the cores are activated, some are left idle, the temperature radiation increases up to, up to 20 Celsius. And so you clearly see some of the cores are un, overcooled, overcooled. Oops, and that's because the cores are cooled with, this, with fans in the node that operate synchronously. There are four independent cores in the server node, and they all uh, act. They uh, act all together to be able to reduce the maximum temperature of the cores within the node. So since they operate based on the maximum temperature the other cores end up being overcooled. The third line here shows the power consumption of the fan. And you see this oscillatory behavior in the fan power. 
So when the uh, cores are idle, it has a quite low power, and then it makes a peak when the uh, cores hit the temperature threshold of 75 degrees Celsius. And then over the time, it makes a few smaller peaks, and after only 10 minutes, it's able to find a stable fan power, which is actually much less than the maximum fan power uh, you see. So how does this temperature variation looks in large scale? Here we compare, we look at the temperature distribution of 1800 cores in two different architectures. The left one is Haswell processors, Intel Haswell processors and Cori, and the right one is IBM Powerade processors uh, on Minsky architecture. And so, so the, this one is more normal distribution, whereas this one is a bit skewed, but the, most, the common thing that they have is they have over 20 degrees Celsius temperature variation in running a same DGEM kernel. It is all balanced, no communication, yet you, see, you still see this at over 20 degree Celsius variation. And another problem I mentioned, again, the oscillatory fan behavior. And how does that look like when we try different CPU utilization? At low CPU utilizations, it causes lower peaks, but at higher CPU utilization, it makes higher peaks in fan power. But different applications also different be shows different behavior. Some makes higher peaks, some makes lower peaks, some application stabilizes higher or lower power levels. And why is this bad? First of all, the oscillation may, might be bad for the wear out of the, it may wear out the hardware more easily. And plus it also shows an uh, opportunity for improving the fan power. For example, here, what if this, since this is the stable fan power, what if we can make this move from the lowest level to this level straight instead of have to having to make that, that big peak? So to be able to solve these temperature variation and these problems in the fan, we have to have a good pre temperature prediction model. And that's very difficult. Why is that? Because there are lots of parameters affecting the core temperatures, including complex workloads, ambient temperature, core frequencies, fan speed levels, uh, physical layout, and hardware variations. And a combination of all those makes a really large parameter space. And we decided to use neural networks for temperature modeling because they have some good properties. For example, they can capture linear and nonlinear behavior between the input and output parameters. They seem to work well in noisy data. And um, the best, I think, is they do not need formulation for an objective function. So you can use them as a black box where you put your input data and get the uh, results. So here's how our neural network model is. First, what we do is, under different core utilizations and core frequencies or in fan speeds, we train our model and we collect how the temperatures look like under these different settings. And then we have to do some pre-processing of the data because we would like to predict the steady state temperature of the cores. We do not care about the transitioning temperature under a certain workload, uh, the transition from the idle and the workload stage. And then after training that, uh, we can use the model in, in deployment to give us core temperatures as a prediction. So while doing the uh, neural network configuration, we try different backpropagation algorithms and different settings such as number of layers and number of neurons. And in the end, what we have here is we were able to predict the core temperatures up to well, one and at most two degrees Celsius error. So now that we have the accurate temperature predict model, what can we do with it? We can do a fan control. And the model can answer this. 
what should be the fan speed level to be able to keep the chips at a certain temperature limit. Or we can do load balancing. What could core temperatures become if a certain amount of data move from one core to another? Third is DVFS. What if we change the frequency? How will the temperatures look like? Now I will start with the fan control. So here we uh, propose a proactive fan control mechanism. I also call it pre-cooling in short. It resembles pre-fetching. So basically, you, the idea is to cool the processor proactively before the application starts or before the application is entering a CPU intensive phase, for example. Here at the red line where the, is the, where the application starts. And the red one is the automatic default fan control mechanism you see, where the, once the application starts, temperatures hit the threshold, and fan makes this peak, and then stabilize afterwards. The green one is the proactive fan control mechanism, where you start pre-cooling the processor before the application starts. So it's you, so temperatures go down, and after the application starts, you reach at the same level with both the fan and the temperatures. And you prevented that peak, fan peak over here, and you saved, you also saved energy, which is equivalent of this area minus this area. So overall, this mechanism can remove the temperature peaks power peaks, and it can achieve the same uh, temperature level uh, as did the reactive fan control mechanism. And this approach can be done via job scheduler, for example, before the application starts, or it can be done via runtime. Um, it can be done without taking control over the whole fan control mechanism as a fallback mechanism that hardware can still uh, take over in case of an error. So, so this looks like how this, in case of a temperature, this was showing only the fan behavior on one node, but fan also behaves differently over different nodes because of the temperature radiation. So uh, over 90 nodes, what you see here is the difference between the maximum power and the stable power is the savings that we can get with this mechanism. And, that's, uh, and with this mechanism, we can uh, reduce the fan power by 35% overall. Now moving on to the other problem of temperature radiation. So I mentioned the four fans in the node operate synchronously and causing this big variation of 20 degrees Celsius. Another optimization that we can do is to decouple the fans. That will allow the each cores in the chip to be cooled differently, cooled based on their uh, needs separately. So by decoupling the fan, you see the right side, notice the change in the y-axis. We can re reduce the temperature radiation from 20 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. And this will add 18% more reduction in fan power. And combining these optimization over different benchmarks, what you see is overall we can reduce the fan power by 53% on average. Now what's the remaining temperature radiation here? That's 10 degree. And that radiation is intra-chip temperature radiation that decoupling the fans is not addressing. So basically this is, the one node has two, two chips, but each chip has 10 cores. And 10 cores can have up to 10 degrees Celsius difference among them. Um, and decoupling the fans will not help with that. What can we do? Can we do DVFS? Well, you can do DVFS, but DVFS only you can do most in most platforms only in chip level. So that won't help reducing the core to core variations within a chip. Next, 
What we can do for that, mitigating the intra-chip variation, is load balancing. Because we can arrange the load within the chip core to core. So here, um, we implement a temperature-aware load balancing, where the goal is to minimize the temperature variation within the, uh, within the chip. And here you see, before load balancing, there is a 5 degree, 6 degree variation among the cores. And after load balancing, it reduces the 2%. So, so for this case, where the within chip temperature variation was 6 degrees Celsius, this ends up this this ends up reducing the maximum temperature by only one degree, and that will help reducing the fan power by only a few watts. So, in a, but the cases where the temperature within chip the temperature variation is larger, for example, like this nine, eight, ten, this portion is more makes makes sense to do load balancing more in that situations. That is most of the case, you can skip that because the benefits won't be too much. So in summary, uh, we propose a neural network based temperature prediction model. And I showed some proactive cooling mechanisms such as fan control and load balancing that we can do using this model. And our results show that and we can accurately predict core temperatures and we can reduce the peak fan power by 53% on average. And this way, air cooling system can be made much more efficient. Um, thank you. Questions? So for the, the plot with the, the proactive fan speed, mm -hmm. so yes, this one. So you've got the case where you wait until it starts getting hot and then you turn the fans up, the, the, the reactive fan control and the preemptive fan control. Yep. What happens if you turn the fans on at the exact point that the load starts? Yep, I forgot to mention that. Yes, it's okay if even if you do the pre-cooling within the range of to three seconds of application starts, it will still work fine. I, for the, in this figure, I did it much earlier to be able to show the idea much clearer. But within the few seconds of the application start or the phase starts, it, it will still work. Right, because it, it looked like you would just like bump up straight yep. to the top line pretty yep. quickly. Yep. I got, I got to use physics. So. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how much motherboard integration do you need to get this to work? For example, if you, you were saying originally the fans were all tied together, is that because the, uh, the, the software that was written by Intel to manage the server was doing that, or because the EUFI on the motherboard was doing that? Yeah, um, that was the IBM uh, note. Uh, but the answer I got was, uh, I asked the same question to the hardware de the developers the, and I got the answer saying that it's not clear how much benefit we will get out of um, having independent fan control versus synchronous fan control because there's also overheads coming with the in independent fan control mechanism because what if a fan fails now? You need to handle that situation then the fans need to be aware of each other. So if you, if one chip, uh, if one, in case of a failure of one fan, the others need to be, operate much higher uh, level than the other. So it increases the complexity of the uh, mechanism increases and um, it's, it's not clear the benefit you get uh, is worth the effort you need to spend. I don't know, 53% power savings is a pretty good benefit. Um, the, the, yeah, but they didn't know that, I think, at that time. Oh, oh, so, so this was in, before you had any test data, like yeah. before you had run any, oh, yeah, very yeah. interesting. So uh, I guess then the corollary to my question is, can you then backport this to older uh, HPC systems that don't have you know, very fancy uh, software control systems? Like, can this just be a software upgrade that you can do? Um, 
Yeah, I think it, it can be done. Like I said, this can be done via job scheduler or runtime. You don't actually need the hardware support to be able to do the pre-cooling. Even though you can leave the fan control mechanism as it is, um, while, while the software still be able to have the rights, the necessary rights to, to be able to set the fan speed. But if you, given that you have that right, which is usually a, you need the root or pseudo access to be able to do that. Given you have that, um, you won't need the hardware modification. All right, so seeing that you've done this work with IBM, it kind of begs the question of uh, how much of this do you think would carry over to water cooling? Oh, yeah, water cooling is interesting uh, because it's, um, it's more expensive than air cooling systems. And I have not studied the behavior of water cooling systems. And actually, one thing I want to mention is the constant fan control here I show, I didn't mention, but I showed here, is the common behavior of water cooling systems. They operate on fixed flow, fixed temperature speeds. And that, that behavior here, what you see, can reduce those peaks that the fan makes um, here. But since uh, for, the, for the idle case, it can be, again, overcooling some of the cases. Since it's not dynamically interacting, um, it can potentially um, consume much more power since the flow rate or the temperature is not changing over time. So it, it's, it's, it's for the worst case, it's able to control the temperatures for the worst case, but for the idle case, it may not be um, the best efficient method. Thank you. Any more questions? Let's thank Bilge.